Hey folks, how's it going? My name is Paul McBride and today I'm going to be talking about how to write better JavaScript using state machines and state charts. Before I get started with the talk, I'm going to introduce myself. So I'm the founder of We Code and I, which is a job board for software engineers just like you and I here in Belfast. So if anyone is looking for a job or if you're hiring, go check out WeCodeandI.com. I'm also an egghead instructor, so I spend a lot of uh, my time outside of my day job creating instructional videos and helping other developers level up their programming skills. And then finally, I'm also the lead developer at a software startup here in Belfast called Nice. So as I said, today we're going to be talking about state machines and state charts. But why do we need those? Well, building UI is hard, like really, really hard. The level to which people expect websites to perform nowadays is getting harder and harder to reach. There are so many things to think about and quite often an infinite number of edge cases. Before we can talk about how state machines can help solve this problem, let's take a look at a simple app. So we're going to be building a little image fetcher. When a user clicks on a button, they'll get back a random GIF. The code for it might look something like this. Now this is React code, but the library or framework doesn't really matter in this case. Here's what that app might look like. When a user clicks on the search button, they get a random image back. Now this might seem like we're finished, but there's a lot of problems with this. Firstly, it, the image might not be returned immediately from our API and the user has no feedback that the image is loading. So we need to do something a little bit like this. We add a loading state to our app, uh, which tracks whether the image has loaded or not. When it hasn't, we can show the user a spinner and when it has, we show them the image. And that would look like this. So the user clicks search, they get a spinner, and then whenever the image is ready, the image pops up. But there are more problems with this. For example, the user can spam the search button a bunch of times whenever the image is still loading, and that would result in multiple network requests being made. And then whenever each one of those network requests finally resolves, they'd have the image be replaced over and over again with the new images that have been loaded. So we need to extend our code a bit further, and it might look something like this. So we've, at the very first line of the handle click function there, we've uh, returned if the image is loading. And we could also use this to, uh, say, disable the button. And that would look something like this. So the user clicks search, they get a spinner, and then the button's disabled. So they can click on that as many times as they want, but nothing happens. And then the image eventually loads in it, and they get to see it. But there's problems with this too, because we haven't taken into account what would happen if the image fails to load. So we can extend our code again, and it would look like this. Now you can see we're tracking uh, some error state, and we can use that to decide whether or not to show the user an error message. And there are so many other steps we would have to take here to make this as bulletproof as users would expect an app to be. For example, they might want to be able to cancel that request, so whenever the image is being loaded, if they click the search button again, or we would change it to cancel, we cancel the request. And that code would look like this. As you can see, for this really simple app, we have a lot of code in our event handler. We have our business logic tightly coupled to our UI, and that's not a good thing. This is commonly called bottom-up development, and there's, there's a lot of problems with it, so let's discuss those. Firstly, this code is more difficult to test than it needs to be. Because our application logic is so tightly coupled to our UI logic, we kind of have to test them both together, and that isn't ideal. It's also kind of hard to read. There's a lot of code there bundled into a single function that handled things across our app. And this was just a simple app. You can imagine how in a more complicated app, that function would be much more complicated as well. Because it's hard to read, that results in more bugs and no one likes bugs in their software. It's also very, very difficult to extend. The more features you add, the more stuff you've got to add to those event handlers. And that results in an app that is extremely difficult to maintain and extend. There is an alternative though, and that gets us kind of into what I want to talk about here, and that is finite state machines. So what are finite state machines? It sounds like quite a complicated term, and if you were to Google finite state machines and end up on Wikipedia, it would probably agree with you. Wikipedia describes them as a mathematical model for computation, but that doesn't really tell us much. Basically, finite state machines have to follow five simple rules. The first of which is that a finite state machine has to have a finite number of states. That seems pretty self-explanatory. It also has to have a finite number of events. 
Third rule is that there has to be an initial state. There has to be a transition function which determines the next state given the current state and an event. And that sounds a lot like a reducer for those that are familiar with uh, Redux. And then it has to have a possibly empty set of final states. Let's take a look at an example of what a finite state machine would look like in the real world. I'm going to use a turnstile as our example here. So that's the little gate you would have to push through to get into, say, a train station. So a turnstile has two states, basically, locked and unlocked. It has to be in one of those states, so it can't be in both and it can't be in neither. And typically, the initial state would be locked. To go from the locked state to the unlocked state, you would insert a coin. So in this case, the event would be coin. And then no matter how many times you insert another coin when you're in the unlocked state, you stay unlocked. And to go back to the locked state, you would push through the, the unlocked gate. If you're locked and you try to push through, nothing happens. This is called a state transition diagram, or STD for short. But we'll stick with state transition diagram. Let's take a look at another example. In this case, we'll look at um, something we're probably all familiar with, which would be a promise in JavaScript. These can be modeled pretty easily as state machines. So the initial state of a promise is idle because it's not been fired off yet. Um, in this case, we're going to model it basically as a fetch. So the first event would be fetch, uh, and that would move our promise into the pending state. And then promises typically have two final states, which would be fulfilled or rejected. And the events that move them from one to the other is from pending to fulfilled, we would fire off the resolve event. And to go from pending to rejected, we would fire off the reject event. So we've had a look at what the state transition diagrams look like. And these are really useful for planning a state machine ahead of time. But it's not much use until we can take a look at it as code. So let's do that. Here is that exact same promise we just looked at, but this time mocked up as uh, some, some working code. Let's break this down. This is our actual machine code over here. Um, you can see that it's basically just a JavaScript object. And you'll notice that there is a finite number of states. We have a finite number of events. We have our initial state, which is idle. And then we have some final states, which are fulfilled and rejected. We know that there are final states in this code because they don't have any events that would lead them back to a different state. We also have the transition function. So that meets our five requirements for a, uh, for a state machine. Let's take a look at what happens when we run this code. So we're firing off the fetch event. And if we take a look up here, our initial state is idle. And whenever the idle state receives a fetch event, its destination is pending. And so we move into the pending state. And then if we, in order to move out of the pending state, it would need to receive either the resolve or reject event. So that gives us this nice function. Basically, the current state plus an event should give us the next state. But unfortunately, with all but the most simple apps, that isn't actually the case, because it leaves out a really important factor, and that is side effects. Where in actual fact, the current state plus an event should give us the next state plus the side effects that we need to run. And side effects in this case, I mean network requests or saving something to a database or manipulating the UI in some way. That's basically the end of the line then for state machines because they don't really have any way by themselves for modeling side effects, which ultimately renders them not all that useful for building modern JavaScript apps. Thankfully, there's a solution and that is state charts. State charts aren't anything new. And in fact, they've been around since 1987 whenever uh, the proposal for them was first put forward. State charts are basically an extension on top of state machines that have a bunch of extra features that make them ideal for building modern apps. Let's take a look at those. So state charts can have uh, what's called extended state. So we looked at um, our state machines before and they had a finite amount of state. In fact, that was pretty important to them. Extended state, uh, or context as it's often called, is where we would store all of the stuff that isn't finite state. For example, we would use uh, context for storing user data, and that might look something like this. You can see we've now added context where the user data is undefined. State charts also give us guarded transitions. And these are functions that allow us to control whether a transition should occur. In this example, um, you can see whenever we are in the pending state and we receive a resolve event, we have a condition function, which in this case always returns true, but it has access to the context and the event that was fired. So we can use that to determine whether this transition should happen or not.
Stitch charts give us actions as well. Uh, and this is where all of our side effects would take place. So we can have entry and exit actions. So that's whenever you move into or out of a particular state. And then we have the transition actions as well. And that is an action that would happen during the transition. So here's an example of what that might look like. So we're in the pending state. And then when we receive the resolve event, you can see here we have the actions function. And this can be a single function or it can be an array of functions. You get access to the context and the event. And right now we're just doing some logging, but we here we can actually change the context. So we could go and fetch a user and then stick the user into context. Now, whenever we're writing state machines, I showed you some code that would work just fine without needing any third party libraries. But state charts are quite a bit more complicated and I don't recommend you try and write that yourself. Whenever I'm writing state charts, uh, I typically use a library called xState, and that's built by a guy called David Kershid, who honestly inspired most of this talk. Um, you should check out xState.js.org if you want to find out more about that. I'm going to switch over to a not so live demo now, and we'll build uh, the same app we saw at the start, except now we'll be using uh, xState to manage all of our state and our side effects. So back at the start of this talk, I walked through an example app and a bunch of the problems with it. I've recreated that app using xState and React, uh, and we can talk about some of the really useful things that xState does for us. To begin with, you can see that I've imported machine and assign from xState, and I've also imported use state from xState React. This is just a little helper that um, allows us to interpret machines for React. There's helpers for Vue and stuff as well. They work for basically every JavaScript library, and also for apps built without JavaScript libraries. Let's take a look at the machine. So we can see here that the initial state is idle. We've got a uh, context, which stores an image URL, which is undefined by default. And then we have all of our states. Before we dive into how, how it works, uh, let's see the app in action. So I click the search button. I go into a loading state. And initially I got an error. My uh, image loader is designed to throw some errors sometimes so that I could test it. But I can retry that. And eventually I'll get a GIF. Uh, whenever the um, image has successfully loaded, uh, we can retry it again as well. And whenever it's actually loading, we can cancel it and we end up back at the idle state. So if we take a look over at how this is implemented, we'll look at the idle state first of all, and it responds to only to a load event. When that happens, it moves to fetching. Now we'll come back to fetching in a minute because it does some complicated stuff that I'd like to dive into a little bit more deeply. But we've also got error and done, and these both work exactly the same way. So they both respond to the retry event, and that pushes them back into fetching. So if we take a look at the uh, fetching state, uh, you'll notice two things here. First of all, there's the thing we've already seen before. Um, there's the on object, which describes the events it responds to. And in this case, it will listen to cancel, which moves it back into idle. But we've also got this invoke object. And what that does is that when we move into this state, it basically invokes a service. So we can open it up and have a look. We have the source for the service, which is the function load image, which I've imported up here. It basically just returns a promise. And we've also got uh, on done and on error. So on error is pretty straightforward. If this promise rejects, uh, we move to the error state. So whenever the promise in load image uh, resolves, we move to on done, which sends us to the um, done state. And then this action function fires. And what it does is takes the data that this promise has given us. In this case, it's just an image URL. And we're, we're assigning it to the uh, image URL in context. So this assign function is the thing that's imported from XTIP. So let's fold this back up again. And as you can see, it all works just like how we described. So we can cancel it. We go back to idle. We can search. And hopefully we'll get an image. We can retry to start it again, and so on. Now, XState has a bunch of other features as well that aren't just related to actually writing your uh, state machine. Let's take a look at the React component and how this how this works. So we're using this uh, use machine function, which we imported from XState React, uh, and we're passing our machine into it, which is what we defined here. Now that returns an array of current and send, current being the current state, and send being a function we use to send uh, events to our machine. Now this, this current value here is actually quite interesting um, because it's not just the current state, it is the um, full data that's held within our state machine and has some useful methods on it as well. Uh, specifically this matches method, 
so current.matches idle. And this can be useful if our state is more complicated than uh, just a string, which it is in all these cases. But we're using this to just uh, render out the appropriate UI. So when we're idle, uh, we show a button that has search. Whenever we're fetching, we've got another button that shows cancel and so on. Now, I think this in itself is a really compelling using to use uh, XState. It allows us to very explicitly define what happens uh, as our app, as we move around our app and how to handle errors. It can handle network requests and stuff for us. But there's one other really cool feature which I've not spoken about just yet, and I'm going to show you how it works now. So we're going to start by importing inspect. And that comes from a separate library, which is uh, XState inspect. We're going to invoke that function. And I'm just going to paste in the configuration options that we need. And then finally, if we scroll down to our use machine call, it takes a second argument, which is uh, the options array, or the options object, sorry. And we want to set dev tools to true. Now I want to do this. You can see that the app reloaded and it opened up this uh, extra page. So let's pull that out and take a look. So it's actually created the uh, state transition diagram uh, automatically for us from our code. And it allows us to click through this um, as if we were interacting with our own UI. So if we head back to the app, you can see we're in the idle state and that's reflected here. Um, and I can send it the load event. It starts the function that we had defined. And in this case, it has resolved successfully and we've got our GIF. I can hit retry, come back here. And this all stays in sync with the actual app itself. It's one of the coolest features of XState. So the conclusions of this then. So some of the pros of using XState, state charts, and state machines is that your code is typically easier to understand. There's one place to go to to find out what your app should do and when it should do it, which means that onboarding new developers is really easy. It also decouples your UI from your business logic, which means that if you ever do need to switch out your UI library, that's pretty easy to do because you don't need to rewrite all your business logic in the way that that UI expected to be done. State charts also scale really well with complexity. Um, because of the, of the fact that they're hierarchical, meaning you can put a state chart inside a state chart and so on, uh, we can have very small focused state charts, which are easier to read, easier to maintain, and so on. Tools like XState also give us ways to visually debug our app. Uh, and in fact, if you have a state chart, um, XState can create the state transition diagram for you. And this means it's really easy to see um, parts of our app that we might have missed or edge cases that we haven't covered. Like all things, however, there are trade-offs. So if you want to use XState or state charts in general, it's a new technology to learn. And for some, this can be an unnecessary burden. Another major downside is that for smaller apps, typically whenever you're writing state charts, you end up with more lines of code overall. This obviously pays off more as, you're, as you build bigger apps, but Whenever you're first getting started, or if your app is small and not particularly complicated, state charts might actually make them more complicated. If your users are particularly sensitive to your JavaScript bundle size as well, uh, state charts might not be a good idea because you're typically going to need a library such as XState, um, and that can obviously increase your bundle size. In conclusion, I think that tools like state charts, and in particular XState, are fantastic for building modern JavaScript apps. There are some downsides to using a tool like this, but I think the pros outweigh those in almost all cases. I talk about XState, state charts, and all other things JavaScript related over on Twitter. So if you're interested in asking me some questions or carrying on this discussion, follow me at The Paul McBride.